Diving in deep water can be a fun and memorable experience, as it is something that not very many people get to do, or have an opportunity to see firsthand what dwells on the ocean floor. But of course, it comes with its risks, and not to mention, you're not the only thing down there. It's time to get comfortable. Hold on to your oxygen tank and let the darkness take control. One of my first experiences doing cave scuba diving, I decided to go dive the cave with my buddy, since we had done it earlier that day when conditions were great. We didn't lay a line either, which was a huge no-no, because there was a pipe along the floor of the cave which we saw on our previous trip. We assumed this pipe began at the entrance and went straight back into the end of the cave. The owners installed it as a water vacuum to help clean the deepest parts of this cave. This day, there had been a high volume of students diving the cavern the large open beginning portion of the cave, which had churned up the silt until you could barely see. This is crucial, because the cavern portion is where you just swim towards the sunlight on a normal dive. To add to our screw-ups, we dove in the evening. Not realising the sun would have set, we begin to dive confidently, trusting in our misguided failsafe and swam to the cavern. Both of us noticed how silty it was, but figured, hey, you can still see the surface, thanks to the sun, and continued towards the cave. Once inside, we swam down to the end, around 200 metres away, and turned around and began to exit. The closer we got to the exit, the worse the visibility got. And by the time we noticed the light at the end of the tunnel wasn't coming, the visibility was barely two feet. Undeterred, we grabbed onto the pipe and followed, hand over hand, to where we assumed the pipe would breach the surface, crawling along foot by foot, holding onto a PVC pipe on the floor. This was the point where we hit a wall, literally. The pipe which we had assumed led to the surface, instead made a bend to a shallower passage of the cave, where it entered the ceiling and disappeared. In this terrible visibility, we followed it into a passage that we'd never seen before, in the part of a cave that was a complete dead end. I'll never forget the feeling of dread and panic that hit me, but the most memorable moment was making eye contact with my buddy as we both realised we were going to die. Most accidental deaths are instantaneous, but in cave diving, you have some time to contemplate your fate as you watch your air pressure needle drop, and panic started to set in. My air needle started moving towards zero, so we fought. Survival instincts set in, and we refused to wait and drown, and instead started crawling in near zero visibility over every part of that cave to find the exit. There is no sign at the entrance warning people of the dangers of cave diving. It's ironic, but the sign that was outside saved our lives, as it's oriented to face the entrance, a fact my buddy remembered, and gave us a point to try and blindly shoot towards the pitch black surface. No surprise it worked. We lived, and one month later, I got back on the horse, got cave certified, and was called a lucky idiot by my cave instructor, and learnt to never make the same mistake twice. I'm a rescue diver in the Bahamas, diving in a submerged blue hole, and a diver went missing. After an hour or two of searching, 
We went back into the blue hole to see if there were any signs of him, and saw the glint of his watch, and his arms sticking out near the bottom. We started descending down to the bottom to recover the body. On the way down, we realised that the bottom was a school of sharks that must have been there for breeding. So many sharks that they blocked the view of the actual bottom. I descended into the darkness, grabbed his arm as I couldn't stand to look at the body, and started ascending. The sharks followed and were circling the both of us, and I had to take a break halfway around 65 feet in order not to get the bends, and was scared shitless. The entire time, waiting to normalise scared shitless. He was struck by a passing boat. I had a dive buddy go out of air on me, on a wreck in the St. Lawrence. Thankfully, this was a no-deco dive, under a hundred metres of water, and we weren't actually inside the wreck. But the part that made it challenging was that the wreck was right in the middle of the shipping lane, where really large freighters travel with really high current. So we couldn't just make an easy ascent to the surface. We had to navigate along a series of lines, pretty thick rope tied off on some good anchor points. That had been laid out to give divers something to hang on to if they could pull themselves against the current onto the path of the wreck and stabilise themselves during the swim back to the anchor line. We were making our exit, and everything was going fine. He was on my long seven-inch hose out in front, and I had a hand on his knees, so we were keeping in good contact. Then, for one moment, I let go of his knee to deal with some gear, and in that split second, he came off the line and got caught in the current, ripping my regulator out of his mouth in the process. I saw him manage to grab hold of another of the lines downstream, and he was hanging on for dear life, completely inverted in a shipping lane, with no regulator in his mouth and no gas in his tank flapping in the current like a flag in the wind. I bolted towards him as quickly as I could, while still managing to keep my own safety, and gathering up the seven inches of abandoned hose and regulator along the way. I caught him, and managed to get the regulator back in his mouth, but since he was inverted, it went in upside down, and as a result didn't breathe like it should. He fixed that himself, but slipped off the line that he was holding onto in the process. I managed to get a hold of him, but not without having to let go of the line myself. I ended up hooking both of my feet around the line to keep us both in place. Somehow I managed to pull us both back down to where we could grab hold of the line. It was at this point that another diver in our group saw what was going on and assisted, and from there, we were able to get back to the boat without any further incidents. I was on a wreck dive off Oahu, down about 90 feet, with an ex-girlfriend and the owner of a local dive shop. The ex and I are experienced divers, and we were all just messing about checking out the wreck, and the turtles nearby. There had been a group that was on the wreck, but they had left as we descended. So it was just the three of us. About halfway into the dive, another person shows up, alone. He got the attention of the dive shop owner, and after furious scribblings on slate, the shop owner came over to us and wrote out, you both stay down here and finish your dive. I'm taking him up. 
and then turned to the other dude and gave the guy his octopus regulator to breathe from. We didn't really know what was going on. So we had a perfectly lovely dive, got some good pictures and ascended as normal. When we got back to the boat, we heard the story. The other guy was from a different boat and had been diving a totally different dive site. He somehow got separated and lost and had somehow drifted about a mile away from where he went in. There was nothing else around in the direction he was going except Tahiti, a few thousand miles away. Worst part is, the other guy's boat didn't even realize he was gone and left without him. If that guy hadn't floated past our wreck, I don't know what would have happened. The current pushes you away from land where we were, and since the boat didn't even know he was lost, he would have been floating out there for a long time before someone realized they had a missing diver. One of my first dives was in shit show conditions. There was a strong current and so much sand debris everywhere that visibility was about 12 inches. For some reason, the dive master was like, it'll be fine once we get below 40 feet. We started descending on a guide wire and after getting to about 55 feet, my brother and I, who were dive partners, could not see anyone else in the group. We waited at the bottom for about 10 minutes, and after no one showed up, we started to think that the rest of the group would be waiting on the surface. We came up, and one guy from our group was at the boy looking confused, and the boat was gone. Turns out, there were so many problems that the boat had driven away so that the waves couldn't throw it on top of us. But there were such large swells that the boat couldn't locate us. We floated for about an hour before finally getting the boat's attention and being picked up. It was by far the worst motion sickness and dehydration I've ever experienced and the fear of being abandoned in the middle of the ocean is probably the worst thing I've ever experienced. This reminds me of an experience I had in Bali with unregulated underwater activities. Our first activity was the underwater walking. We had all got in a little speedboat and then took a short five minute trip out to another boat that had all the equipment. The activity was similar to that time I did snuba in the Caribbean, in that the oxygen tanks were up on the surface of the water. Instead of having a scuba mask to breathe out of though, we had this very heavy helmet and it was placed on our heads, as well as rubber shoes, so that our feet wouldn't be mutilated by the coral. I went first, and the procedure was very simple. I just went on a ladder with most of my body in the water. They placed a rubber circle on my head to cushion my shoulders and make a seal with my helmet, I presume. And then they put the helmet on. The second that it was on my body, I felt its weight forcing me to the bottom of the ocean. It was kind of scary because I went down pretty fast, which caused the pressure to build up very quickly. I made sure to swallow and yawn a bunch and I was fine. Also, I could never really get a deep breath of air because as I breathed in, the helmet began to make a vacuum and I would have to stop to let it fill with more air. My other friends followed suit, and then a scuba diving man came down to be our guide. He handed all of us 
a piece of bread in a plastic bag, which drew all the fish out to us. It was fun to see. There were metal guiding handrails on the ocean floor, which I followed, with my friends right behind me. It was very difficult to walk, because the current was surprisingly strong, and the helmets were quite heavy. We all enjoyed it, though. As I breathed, there was a constant loud sound, as water whined in through the tube. It was kind of annoying, but it meant that I was getting air, which is very good. That's why it was so scary when the sound suddenly stopped. I was confused, but it quickly came back on after about four seconds, and I could breathe again. I rationalized it by assuming that my tank had run empty, and that they were switching it to a different one. No big deal. I didn't understand how they would run out of air so quickly, but I didn't think too hard about it. No big deal. It came back on, and I could breathe again. After about ten minutes, the guide points to me, and indicates that he wants me to climb over the railing. I was very confused, but I did it after he made it very clear that that was what he wanted. It was kind of hard to see any peripherals out of the mask, so it was easy to get lost. I looked behind me to make sure I saw where my friends were. In order for us not to get lost, we made eye contact, so I assumed we were all good, and then turned back around to follow the guide. He had me waiting in a very small path between two corals, so I went very slowly to make sure that I didn't cut my legs up on any of them. It was hard due to the strong underwater current. My unwieldy helmet, and an occasional tug by the air tube, as I pulled it. As I reached the guide, my air stopped again. I figured it was no big deal, like the previous two times, and continued on. I followed him a bit, and it still didn't come on. Five seconds, ten seconds. I was starting to get confused. Was this some kind of joke? If so, it wasn't funny at all. Fifteen seconds. I thought to myself, "Don't panic. They always tell you not to panic." I panicked. I started taking quicker and quicker breaths, but I forced myself to stop that. I knew that was the worst thing I could do. I spun around to the guide, then started pounding my fist on my chest. That was the sign for, I can't breathe. He seemed to notice, and started walking away. I thought maybe, I should just try and shrug off the helmet, and swim to the surface. I didn't even know if I had enough air to make it though. I didn't know if the boat was above me, and I didn't want to hit my head. I didn't know if I could actually shrug it off, and I didn't want to get the bends. So I figured it wouldn't be a good idea. After thirty seconds, I started to notice that I was getting less and less oxygen with each breath. Water was starting to fill my helmet, and I had to look up to breathe what little air I had. I grabbed hold of the guy's arm, so that I wouldn't lose him, and also so that he would understand the gravity of the situation. I gave him quite the death grip. Forty seconds, and I saw the ladder of the boat. I knew that all I had to do was make it there, and I would be okay. I must have gotten some sort of adrenaline rush, with a renewed hope, because I almost forgot about my lack of air. I fumbled for the ladder for a few seconds, and it was hard to tell distances through the helmet, because. It had a bit of a magnifying aspect to it. Before I grabbed it, and started pulling myself up. As I broke the surface, air came rushing into my helmet, and I took a nice deep breath. Breathing had never felt better. 
That was definitely the scariest experience of my life and would never recommend it to anyone. I went for my first dive on holidays. It wasn't very deep and I was tethered to the instructor. We were down for a couple of meters and I was about 15 years old. I loved swimming and general adventure, so I was loving it. When we went back to the surface, and I asked if we could go any deeper, I was told the weather was going to get worse. That's why we came up, and didn't go very deep to begin with. We went home, and was talking to my friend, and one of their dads said, But aren't you asthmatic? And I was like, yeah, but it doesn't really affect me. And he basically told me, if I had gone for a proper dive, I could have had an asthma attack and died underwater. As of course, I wouldn't have had an inhaler available. I was diving on Koh Tao last month, on a site I've been to before. The descent was fine, very poor visibility under a meter, and fairly strong currents, but we had heard that there was a whale shark nearby, so we were just swimming around looking for shadows. We went through a narrowish gap in the rocks single file, and someone ahead stopped. Once I stopped, I felt the current, and got pushed sideways into the rock, and couldn't see where I was going. I felt something touch my leg, and as I pulled away, it was like 30 bits of tiny Velcro stuck to my leg, and it was being ripped off. I turned around, and all I could see was loads of pink sea anemones, but not the little cute ones you see in Finding Nemo. These things were colossal. I panicked, not knowing what had got to me and ascended to get above the gap, and got out of the way of everyone to assess my leg. I was coming up in a lot of one to two centimetre white welts, from halfway up my shin to halfway up my thigh all around my leg. I swam ahead and grabbed my diving master's fin, showed him my leg, and he did the sign for a jellyfish. I shook my head and did the sign for an anemone fish, and drew a house shape with my fingers. Nemo home. He got out his whiteboard and wrote, let me know when it gets too bad to continue. This really worried me. How long did I have until the pain was unbearable? How much more painful would it get? Will there be any other symptoms? I stuck to him like glue the rest of the way, an arm's length distance just in case. I completed the dive in a fair amount of pain, but not unbearable, totally amazed by my obvious, incredibly high pain threshold. Back to the boat, my dive master came to check on me, with another one, by which point I had 30-ish red blisters covering half of my leg. The other guy just did not believe me that it was an anemone sting. He put his whole face in one and just got tingly lips. Turns out, I'm super allergic. I asked him about the whole when it gets too bad business, but it turns out it was a mistranslation, as he's Dutch. What he really meant to say is if it gets so bad. Good, I was actually shitting myself. The blisters didn't go down for a week. And once I was back in England, I ended up on steroids and antibiotics for a week. And now, I have just zero pigments where the sting were. So it's almost like a funky reverse tattoo. Two summers ago, I went to Florida Sea Base for scuba camp. One of the last dives you do is the night dive where you go to the first reef you dove on, but at night. Now I've been super hyped for this dive, because tons of cool stuff 
comes out at night. I saw several sea turtles, barracuda, lobsters, eels, and plenty of fish. I even had a squid come about a foot away from me, which was probably the defining moment of the trip. However, in the low light setting, we couldn't see the hundreds of moon jellyfish floating above us. Moon jellies can sting, but it doesn't hurt too badly. I got stung by them a few other times while surfacing on other dives. I turned to the side to get a better view of the group, and as I was turning back over, a moon jelly somehow got caught in my swim trunks. I had no idea how it happened, but I knew that it had happened as soon as I felt the pain. The jellyfish was stinging up my leg, dangerously close to my crotch. For a solid 10 seconds before my panicked, pain attempts to push it out of my trunk succeeded, I had dealt with plenty of other situations like sharks, lionfish, jellyfish, and common diving mishaps, like masks bumped off, loss regulators and the like. In a cool and collected manner before, but this time, I was just being driven by pain, panic, and fear. I was absolutely terrified of what had happened, and I still had to go through all the jellyfish on the surface with a leg that was swollen and could barely move. I shakingly surfaced at a safe rate with a group and got back to the boat with the assistance of the dive masters. Most of them thought I was exaggerating the sting when I told them what happened. That was, of course, until I showed them my leg. I had this huge reddish rash looking thing all over my leg. I had to soak it in vinegar for the rest of the boat ride, and I hobbed around for the rest of the trip. But it was all worth it, because I saw a squid. It might not have been death or sharks, but dealing with something so painful, from something as insignificant as a moon jellyfish, and knowing I wasn't done yet, was the scariest thing that I have been through. I was on my first real dive after getting certified. My cousin drove me to Monterrey, and we drove to the same beach where I got certified. Five to ten minutes into the dive, we're greeted by a couple of sea otters. We're right next to a jetty, so I move closer in and attempt to stay stationary, so I can just sit and watch the sea otters. My cousin has been right above me the whole time, so when I feel a poke and pinch on my armpit, I think it's just him or his flipper hitting me. I turn around and see that he's still above me. Adrenaline kicks in as the pinch has become stronger, and I can see what's touching me. I spit out my regulator and tore off my mask in a panic when the pinch started hurting. I tried spinning around, but I was just moving into an incoming wave, and it felt like I was being held back. My cousin jammed his regulator into my mouth and turned me around again. I thought he was trying to hug me. He had his arms around me and then let go. He grabbed my regulator and his own and then swapped them. Then he turned me around again and a giant spider crab was retreating into a crevice, into its boulders behind me. My cousin had said it had at least two claws on me when he saw me pulling my mask off. He told me he understood my panic but he never took me diving again, and I've never wanted to since. I'm sharing this story in memory of my late father. My dad grew up in Southern Florida. He became certified at a young age and specialized in cave diving. In fact, he mapped some of the underwater caves for local organizations and governments. 
in his twenties, his good friend got married to a woman who happened to love diving just as much as my dad and his friend. One day, the friend's wife decides to go for a dive in one of the more complex caves they'd been to. The wife and the other person she was diving with get lost in the cave and unfortunately never make it back up. When she never made it back home, my dad's friend goes to the cave and dives in looking for her. I think it was just by himself, but I'm not sure since my dad never spoke about it too much. Going solo is dumb, but I take it the guy was just upset about his wife. Unfortunately, my dad's friend never made it back either. So now, with three bodies in the cave, the local police discuss the situation with my dad, and eventually, he goes down into the cave to recover all three bodies. He sometimes did cadaver dives for them in the past, I believe, and I can only imagine seeing three of your closest friends dead in a very complex cave network deep underwater. It no doubt was absolutely horrific, and I think my dad quit diving after this, as he never took me before he passed away. We were in a river, in a city around Savannah, looking for a sidearm that was thrown in to avoid detection. The water was zero visibility, even though it was only seven to eight feet deep, and we were basically using our hands and feet to scour the area. After about 45 minutes, and a lot of boredom, something big swam past me. It never touched me, but pushed the water around me enough to flip me over head over heels. Imagine being underwater and pushing your hand past your face as fast as you can and feeling the water rush by. I felt four tugs on the landing line telling me to surface, so I immediately tugged the line that was attached to my partner four times and started to ascend. When we got to the surface, the guys on the boat started screaming at me to get out of the water. A giant gator was seen entering the water and swimming in our direction. Even the local guy was a healthy shade of green. Ten years later, I still think about the alligator I never saw. I was doing a live abroad off the coast of the Cocos Island, which is part of Costa Rica, with my dad and brother about six years ago. I was about 20 and had been certified since the age of 16. So although still relatively new, I had some decent experience. So one morning, we were heading to a dive location, and the weather and water is fairly rough going. I didn't think much of it, because things still tend to be a bit calmer below. But this was not the case. A group of us, about a dozen divers, and the dive master, all enter the water and proceed to descend using a guideline. Visibility was poor but still wasn't bad, and the current was incredibly strong. You would literally be moved 15 to 20 feet in one direction, and going against the current was nigh impossible. So at the bottom, at around 80 feet diving with my dad and brother, I kept a constant eye on my dive computer. I know the threshold for what's safe, and when to start to head to the surface. But with the current, the dive master wanted everyone to descend and ascend on the guideline around the same time. I see my air starting to get low, and I knew that I had burned through it quickly due to the strain of the current. 
so I signal my dad, what my air level is at, and that I think we should head up. Luckily, the group was all filing in line on the guideline and proceeded to slowly ascend to do their safety stops. At this point, I was relatively calm. But as I realised I was one of the last divers in line to go up, I started to get worried about air. Well, to speed up the story, I ran out of air at around 80 feet in strong current and had to buddy breath with my twin brother on the way up. In retrospect, although running out of air is never good, I was still not in too life-threatening of a situation, as there were plenty of divers to share air with just in case anything went wrong. But the whole situation still shook me up, as it probably would most people. When I got back to the main boat, I pretty much broke down, and other than taking a quick dive the next day to see if my nerves could handle it, I've never been since. I however told my dad recently I might want to take it up again, and not let this incident ruin diving for me. For some, sharks are their fear about diving. For others, it's drowning. But for me, it would have been running out of air and being unable to avoid my certain death on the sea floor. I went snuba diving, which is air tanks on surface and air delivered by hose, for the first time about eight years ago. And on my second trip down, the instructor returned to the surface to check my tanks. I was 15 feet down, and my mask began filling with water and I couldn't clear it. I could still breathe through my mouth, but I made the mistake of looking up to see how far I would have to swim to reach the surface if breathing was a problem. The surface seemed a lot further away than I thought it was, and I recall it triggering something akin to my fear of heights. But I kept my head and continued to breathe normally and gave the guy my signal to return to the surface. I didn't want to attempt to begin the ascent by myself, because my dive instructor was a real dick when I first arrived with a camera in tow. I had called before I made my reservation or brought the camera and underwater housing, and they said it would be fine. But of course, when you get there, he's actually a dick, and says that I'm an idiot for trying to bring it along. I thought he might end my dive right there, and in fairness, after I explained to him that I had no intention of screwing around, and that I understood how dangerous diving was, and that I had researched the hand signals and such before I arrived, he was a little bit better. But I still didn't trust him after the initial fiasco. Luckily, I managed to reach the surface, but nonetheless, having your helmet fill up and having no oxygen being fed to you, was no doubt the scariest moment of my life. If I hadn't have got his attention quick enough, or if certain situations would have happened where he would have been distracted, no doubt that could have ended a lot worse than it fortunately did. I was doing lionfish research in the TCI, where we would go to different depths and measure lionfish population sizes, size and habit preferences. We had a few close encounters with stubborn lionfish under massive coral mounds, but the scariest experience came from my dive master. Because of the nature of our research, we did transects in one direction so our boat would do a live pickup wherever we ended up. The boat would know our location, and we would send a safety sausage, which is an inflatable marker that looks like a mini flip floppy tube that you'd see as a car dealership sale, and then ascend. As we neared the end of one of our hundred foot dives, I noticed my dive partner acting funky. Definitely the onset 
of becoming sufficiently numbed. I'm watching out for her and trying to ensure that she doesn't get too close to the lionfish while my dive master gets out the safety sausage to send up to the surface. There's my dive master blow up the safety sausage, the weighted component of the line that let the safety sausage catapult to the surface while staying anchored at whatever depth we were at, bounced off something, knocked her goggles and snorkel off and wrapped itself around her arm. The safety sausage catapulted up, pulling up my dive master. Luckily, I quickly reacted, grabbed her ankle and she shot upwards. We yanked her down and flipped her around and started swimming as hard as we could downwards. That gave her about 10 seconds as it still pulled us upwards for her to wriggle her arm out of the line and free herself. I pulled her back down to the sea floor and she cleared her mask and just sat there heaving for a few minutes. Meanwhile, I looked over and see that somehow my knocked partner had the dive master's lost snorkel in her hands. My knocked research partner still believes to this day that she played an essential role in saving the dive master's life. I was diving with my dad in Mexico. At the time, he had 25 years of experience. I'd only just been certified, and this was my first recreational dive after that. Since we were on vacation, we had to book with an outfit group. The boat and equipment didn't look high end, but it was about average for local outfits. A few minutes after descent, Dad is swimming furiously to the dive leader, doing the no air sign, and after a couple of seconds of no response, basically grabs the guy's octopus rig. I don't know if the dive leader was confused, but he was grabbing at my dad's hand as he reached for him. We ascended, and he told me that his primary flooded, and the secondary had stopped too. Not sure what happened, but oh my god. My dad was obviously furious at the guy, and for whatever the hell had been the wrong equipment, but otherwise unfazed. I was mostly confused underwater, not fully understanding what I'd seen. The real fear set in later. What if I'd taken that rig? Just trained, 19 years old. An experience only in close supervised settings. I don't know if I would have reacted correctly, especially with someone trying to grab my hand. It was scary. I've only done a handful of dives over the last 19 years, and they were all amazing. I was snorkeling in open blue water, 200 yards off a reef wall with a pod of dolphins. I noticed what I thought was a grey reef shark, about 60 feet below me, which I'm perfectly comfortable around. It started swimming upwards in circles towards me. At first, I thought to myself, wow, that's a larger reef shark. But as it continued ascending to about 30 feet below me, I instantly recognised the round flat snout and striped pattern on its back. My heart rate quickened and breathing increased as I realised it was a 12 foot tiger shark that was curious about me and continued ascending in a wide spiral at me. I immediately attempted to hail my boat captain who was 150 yards off using the shark and come get me hand signal but he thought I was just waving and having fun watching dolphins that were no longer within my view. In the back of my mind, I thought that worst case scenario, maybe the dolphins will come and save me, as my boat captain was unresponsive and the level of risk was exaggerated in my mind since I'd never seen a tiger shark, I realised I would have to swim to the boat. Swimming freestyle with fins. 
I would take a few strokes and look back down to keep my eye on the shark. After doing this three or four times, the shark had reached the surface and was swimming parallel with me towards the boat about 20 inches to my right. I even saw its dorsal fin breach the water. Then, as a result of the moderate chop, I lost sight of the fish. Not knowing where it was freaked me out even more, and I broke into a full sprint towards the boat, no longer trying to keep my eyes peeled for it. I didn't wait for the captain to put the ladder down, and just held myself over the freeboard, nearly out of breath, and I didn't see the shark again. My college required one gym class to graduate, but the classes they offered were actually pretty fun. So I took scuba diving. During my basic certification dive, my regulator started free flying. After diving in a 75 degree pool all semester, I was in a 40 degree lake for the actual dive, which added to the stress. We were trained in how to deal with a free flow, so I did what I was supposed to do. Unfortunately, I sucked water. That's really scary when you're 35 feet from the nearest breathable oxygen. And I panicked. I signaled the dive master, and we flew to the surface very quickly, with me using his secondary regulator. When I got up there, I was too freaked out. He had the presence of mind to reach between my flailing arms to inflate my BCD, and likely saved my life. That at least kept me on the surface of the water. When it was all said and done, I couldn't put my face underwater without having a panic attack. I went on to eventually get my advanced open water diving certification. But the first couple of dives after that first incident were incredibly tough to do. I was cutting an eight inch pipe with a reciprocating hydraulic saw in about 30 feet of water. The guy before me cut all but the last few inches of the pipe and called it a day. I had never cut a pipe before. Before I got in though, I asked the previous guy what was up. He told me to stand on top of the pipe and push the saw down in the cut with one foot, while holding onto the crane straps that were attached to either side of the cut. I jumped in, got down to the cut and started to saw. I had my face real close to the pipe, because visibility was only a few inches. When I was going to make a few strokes to make sure the saw was lined up, then I climbed on top, and after about 20 seconds of cutting, the pipe snapped, and it hit me in the face. Well, in the faceplate. It put a nice nick in the face ring, and knocked me back a few feet. The thing is, if anything had been behind me, I would have been crushed. Which is something horrifying to think about. I am a dive instructor, and I certify people at the Ginny Springs. I was there the day before the students were going to show up and decided to do a drift dive to look for GoPros or hidden treasures at the bottom of the river. I've done it hundreds of times and never ran into any issues. But this dive, Judy went south. I was diving a backplate and wing setup with an 80. Drift diving with three other instructors and helpers. Start the drift dive, and head straight to the deepest part of the river, which was about 25 feet. It had also been raining really badly, so visibility was about 6 inches with a 300 lumen light. Worst I've had. So I had my face on the bottom searching for stuff. About 15 minutes into the dive, I just stop. I figured I just ran into a log. I can't see shit, so I back up 
and something moves across my back. I'm like, what the hell? What was that? So I spin quickly, and my leg rips out my mouth, and I drop my dive light. It's attached to my wrist, but I can't get the light back. It's caught on something. So I use my left hand to grab my octo from my clip around my neck, but it's not there. I'm not really worried, just really confused and I can't see shit. So I decide to just go up. In 35 feet of water, no problem. Except I can't get my left arm free. That's when something hits me between the neck and first stage. Worst thing pops into my head. It's a gator. So I'm like, shit, I gotta get away from it and I just spaz out trying to get free, and finally do. I swim to the surface, scared to death of what just happened, and regain my composure. I had no idea what happened, so I go back down to investigate. I had swam between a log on the bottom, and gotten stuck in the chaos, and I managed to wrap my light around the branch on the log, and just about killed myself because I didn't stay calm, and thought it was a gator attack. The whole ordeal took less than a minute, but it felt like eternity. I am a Paddy, a Naui instructor living in the Florida Keys. I've been down here teaching for several years, and I am also a master captain, and run several different dive boats in the area. Yeah. Animals are pretty scary. Situations with them are somewhat unpredictable. But for the most part, you would know exactly what to expect. Shark? It will investigate a bit. Then based on how you react, it will decide to leave you alone or investigate further. Barracuda will check you out for a while, but a huge bluffers. The whole thing that they go after shiny stuff is a total myth. Shiny objects makes them interested, but no cuda is dumb enough to challenge a human because it sees a pair of earrings. And the list goes on. But for me, it's the tiny dangerous creatures that get to me, and the biggest and dumbest creatures, the human beings. I would rather go 10 rounds with a big scary shark than go on a dive with a panicky human. I don't think that there's anything down there that isn't as scary as the infamous fellow man. I can group my stories into animals, non-animals and human scares. Regarding animals, I did a night dive on the wreck of the Spiel Grove, an excellent dive. Diving out all the naughty branch and urches on a rail. When I realize I was about half an inch from putting my hand onto a scorpion fish. They are beautiful animals, but have excellent cryptic camouflage. Oh, and if you get stung by their spines, it'll probably make you pass out from the pain. I was told by a physician down here that they would just put you into a medically induced coma until the venom works its way out of your system, rather than put your heart through the stress of the pain. I've been hit several times by lionfish, a distant cousin of the scorpionfish, and they are pretty nasty. Also, grabbing a scorp by the spines definitely made me pucker. Non-animal was clearing the boat's bottom for some side cash one winter. One trawler style boat was pretty awful and had almost no room at all to get under to scrape the keel. As I'm under the boat with my tank just touching the mud and my chest is touching the hull, I start to notice that the hull is moving a bit closer. Then I realize that my tank is lodged in the mud and that the hull 
is starting to feel very unforgiving. Turns out the tide was starting to go out while I was underneath the hull, and I was in very real danger of being slowly turned into a diver-shaped pancake. Thankfully, my dumb ass wriggled out of there quietly and watched the boat sink down with the tide while re-evaluating my life choices. On the human spectrum, oh lord, where do I start? So many stories of watching students underwater, knowing that they are about to panic and hoping that you get over to them in time. Having a regulator torn out of your mouth by a random guy that wasn't watching his air is another. There was another occasion where a mate and I dove in after a lady who jumped in with too much weight on and wasn't wearing her regulator, the breathing device in her mouth. Her eyes just watched us as she sank and the few seconds it took to reach her and help felt pretty stretched. As a captain, I can say that there's nothing quite like the feeling of waiting for late divers. We give them times to be back on the boat so we can get back before happy hour. Man, when they are getting super late and you're scanning the waves with your binoculars for bubbles, it can get pretty tense. I've never had someone disappear on me, but I've had plenty of rescue situations where afterwards my hands would start to shake if I wasn't holding the steering wheel. There are days where I can't believe that I'm getting paid to do this, and days where I can't believe they don't pay me more to do this. I still wouldn't trade what I do for anything. I love the dive industry, even when it's bad. This is the most beautiful, heart-wrenching, and gut-punching place to live and work. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed today's journey to the depths. It was my first time doing diving stories. I was actually going to do ocean stories, but in the end, managed to find a heap of diving ones and thought that you guys might like an interesting perspective. If you did enjoy it, please do remember to drop that magic like and hit the little bell icon and subscribe in order to keep up to date with everything I post. If you have a story that you wish to share with me, all that you need to do is share it to my Reddit page or go ahead and send it to my email. Both of these can be found in the description. But anyway, for now guys, I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.